Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is video number 7, and we're going to be looking at coding and non-coding DNA, and certainly some of the potential consequences of mutation in each of these regions. So what we want to do is we want to be able to assess the significance of coding and non-coding DNA segments in the process of mutation. What this means is hopefully you'll be able to uh, define introns and exons and link them to parts of the coding and non-coding uh, to con contrast those regions and what they do, and therefore to be able to access, uh, to assess the relative significance of mutations in each of these regions. So what we want to look at in this video is coding and non-coding DNA. So um, there are two terms that are often associated with these. Exons represent the coding DNA and introns to represent the sections of the DNA that aren't coding for anything specifically that we're aware of. So let's look at each of these terms separately and uh, see if we can analyze some of the consequences of mutations in each. So the coding sections of DNA or the exons are the ones that we've studied uh, up to this point. So they're the ones that result in the production of polypeptides, ultimately proteins. And so any mutation that can happen in these will result in the failure to produce a functional polypeptide. We've looked at some diseases where things as simple as a single um, substitution of a nucleotide, uh, a nitrogenous base in a nucleotide can cause a protein to not function correctly and can lead to certain types of diseases like cystic fibrosis, for example. Um, However, non-coding DNA is something where we're slightly less aware of the sorts of uh, functions that it has. We don't know whether, we, we, we're sort of pretty clear that they're likely to not um, specifically lead to the production of polypeptides, but we don't know if they're gene regulators, or whether they are just uh, additional bits of nonsense DNA that don't do anything in particular. We haven't found out exactly what their function is. So, if they do have a regulatory function, if they do uh, consist of areas um, that we might call operons, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on, then there may be something that um, acts as a switch to turn a particular uh, production process for a polypeptide on or off. Now, quite obviously, as you'd imagine, if you could get a mutation in an area like that, then the switch may not work properly. It may, it may be permanently on, it may be permanently off, or it may be switching on and off at the wrong times. So regulatory function of these introns can actually have some significant impacts on um, the individual as well. So if we focus on these just for a moment, then, then hopefully you'll understand that the um, if we assume for a moment that some of these introns, some of these regions of non-coding DNA actually play a role in regulating gene activity, then obviously a mutation that occurs in any of these is going to affect that function. It's going to stop it from functioning uh, properly. If they don't directly code for proteins but control the uh, action of regulatory proteins, then they may belong to this little category that we call operons, which is, which is, I guess, a shortened version of operator on the operon. So that's like a, uh, it's like a, a gene switch, if you like. Now, there are certain chemicals which may act as gene switches. That is, if the concentration of them reaches a certain level, that's detected and therefore the protein switch is turned on, uh, such as the production of an enzyme to break down a, a particular type of chemical. Um, and so any mutation that can occur in this kind of a region can have some quite significant consequences on the um, production of certain proteins and therefore their, their function in the, in the cell. On, I guess, a more broad level, any change that can occur in non-coding DNA could result in proteins either being expressed at the wrong time or perhaps in the wrong place and possibly even in the wrong amounts. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about regulator proteins. We're talking about ones that are kind of keeping an eye on things. We've talked in our... Um, uh, non-infectious disease and disorders uh, topic about module about um, homeostasis and how the body can regulate 
um, certain conditions like temperature, glucose levels, water levels. And this is the kind of the same sort of thing that's happening at the cellular level. Certain chemicals which the cell is able to try and keep in balance and therefore will have certain proteins being produced, perhaps certain enzymes that help to regulate those levels. And anything that's happening with the regulator um, is going to affect the cell's ability to do that. There's a nice little mnemonic, um, something that I've, I've pinched from a, from a former colleague of mine, and this is a little shout out to Brooke. Um, do visit this website. Um, she has pr produced some fantastic result resources. She um, is a wonderful curator of resources, so she's pulled a lot of things together there, um, and I highly recommend um, her site to you. One of these nice little graphics which I've taken from the site um, is, is this one with the mnemonic STING. Uh, mnemonics are a great tool um, for memory, for study, for you to try and um, keep track of some of the important things that you need to try and remember. Um, and that can be useful for things like the order of the processes in uh, cell division. Here, STING stands, stands for these five types of non-coding DNA. So we've looked at that sort of gene regulator function, but there's lots of different types. So there's satellite DNA, and satellite DNA are just tandem repeats. You might have um, had some sort of discussion previously about tandem repeating sequences, a telomeres, and these are again regions of repetitive DNA at the end of chromosomes and they seem to have something to do with um, aging. Telomeres are one of the interesting things that we looked at when um, Dolly was cloned, the first uh, sheep that was cloned, and didn't uh, reach the same sort of age as we might have expected of a, a normal uh, sheep. And so therefore, one of the things that was looked at was the number of telomeres that, that uh, she had. Introns, we've talked about before, these are kind of the little non-coding sequences within the genes, and they can be removed by RNA splicing prior to the formation of uh, messenger RNA. Then non-coding RNA genes, so uh, a fourth kind of group of these non-coding DNA regions. Uh, and finally, the ones that we've talked about already in a little bit of detail, the gene regulatory sequences that might be um, involved in that um, stimulating transcription, promoters, enhancers, silencers, uh, operons, those sorts of things. So there's a range of different types of non-coding DNA, all of which, um, if they uh, uh, suffer mutation, can have differing kinds of impacts uh, on the cell and on the organism. What about coding DNA? Well, we don't need to talk too much about the significance of coding DNA because this is what we've been talking about right up until this point. Because coding DNA is basically the section of the DNA that links to protein production, then any mutations are going to cause um, some problem with the production of the protein and that can cause a number of different types of genetic diseases, many of which we've um, already mentioned uh, on the way in this course. Changes in the coding segments uh, can result in chromosomal aberrations as well. So we can, we've looked at mutation at both the gene level, genic mutations, and also at the chromosomal level, which is multi-gene um, consequences for these sorts of mutations. And as we've talked about, mutations can basically have three separate consequences. They can um, be harmful, they can be neutral, or they can even be beneficial. And where they are beneficial, they might be one of the key drivers of natural selection, of increasing variability within a population and perhaps um, creating some sort of um, physical characteristic that may be um, better suited, uh, more likely to be selected uh, within a changing environment. So this is a range of different types of um, consequences for coding and non-coding DNA, some of which we've looked at previously, others which we've just uh, kind of opened the door on now. The, our understanding of the DNA is growing day by day and there's always going to be updated information that's well worth um, trying to just deepen your knowledge in some of these areas. And of course, we'll do some of that back in the classroom. Thanks for watching.